there an alternative to war? Yes, I think there is. There might be in the future, but with the world as it is, I think that force may be the only way to peace. I completely disagree with that statement. There must be an alternative to war, otherwise there won't be any world at all. This is the opening program in our 1956 High School Forum discussion series. Here tonight to discuss alternatives to war are four students from as many countries, part of the forum group of 33. Let me introduce to you first Judith Reeder from the United Kingdom. Judith has to take her entrance exams to Oxford in less than three weeks' time, and she's not going to be completely relaxed until that ordeal is over with. We've arranged for her to take them here in the United States. Then, Elizabeth Ann Woodgate from Australia. Elizabeth Ann had her first experience ice skating yesterday, and uh, we hope you won't be too uncomfortable, Elizabeth Ann. Naviat Tafari is the first delegate the Forum has ever had in its ten years of existence from Ethiopia. We welcome you especially, Naviat. And Christoph Bertrand from Germany. Within the last hour, Christoph's got a new nickname, Toffee. <laughs> now look, let's get back on to our question for tonight. Is there any alternative to war? I think perhaps we ought to start out by finding what any of you know about war from personal experience. How about you, Judith? Well, I personally was lucky during the war. I lived in a, a small town away from London, away from the big industrial towns, and so consequently, I didn't suffer any of the bombing. But what I remember most clearly about the war was that my father was away all the time. He was in Germany. And I remember clearly how worried my mother was all the time. And I remember having to get under the bed when the sirens went. <laughs> but, uh, what about Australia? Well, of course, we didn't, uh, we, didn't have as much, we didn't have any bombing like England did. But uh, my father was away and my uncle was a prisoner of war in Germany. <laughs> and um, I know there was a lot of tension at home and my mother was always very worried. And when Daddy came home on leave, there was always great joy and excitement. <laughs> we all well, what about Germany? Where were you during the war, during the beginning of well, it, Christoph? I, I don't think that there's time enough to count all those places, you know, as we... Uh, came from Berlin to some place in uh, Austria, and then we came to the to Palmer, and that is up in the uh, eastern corner, or some of the eastern corners of Germany. Then uh, we fled. Uh, to but what do you remember most? Oh, what I remember is that my father was away during the whole war, and even longer. He uh, was taken prisoner of war in 1940 and came back in 1947. He was in Australia. <laughs> well, a quid pro quo. How about you, Navy? Do you remember anything well, about... Well, I haven't physically suffered from the war, but uh, the fact that my mother was in worry all the time was that my father was uh, in Rome. And well, you're uh, talking about the Italo-Ethiopian oh, yes, War now. Yes, yes. Uh, it started in 1936 and lasted till 1941. And the fact that my parents were... Uh, my relatives and parents were wearing black coats, in, were in black because my... Uh, uncle was burnt alive by Italians. Uh, let me ask you, how serious you think the threat of war is today? You scarcely remember the last one, or as you say, you weren't really in the worst of it. How serious do you think the threat of war is today? Well, I think there is very lot of tension in the world, and uh, it only needs a little match, and uh, this match to be hold to the tension, and it'll explode. Sorry. There are so many places in the world that are full of this tension, full of the danger that it might be and ex uh, might explode there. And uh, I think, therefore, the situation is very dangerous in this case. And it's very, um, you got to be, well. Uh, it's, it's only in the major com uh, countries that there is such tension, though, because out in Australia, I mean, I, I, I'm, I don't call Australia a major country, of course, very important to me, but uh, there's not very much tension actually in Australia, but there is, when I've come over here to America, I've seen the tension that there is. And in Russia, I should imagine, it would be very similar. It's a strange question because you'd think that England, having suffered in the last war, would, would be very afraid of another war. But speaking for the average person over there, I think uh, we're sort of relaxed nowadays. Yes. There may be political tension or economic tension in the world, but at home we think the world is over and the young people over there, we naturally we're worried about communism, but not as worried as perhaps some other European countries, such as Germany, yeah, for instance. We are, you know, Germany is divided and we have a long frontier with the Russian zone and we meet a lot of people from the Russian zone and we talk things over with them and uh, we get overwhelmed and very much impressed by things they tell us. And, uh, you know, it's, 
it is a strong, I think it's a strong tension in Germany and among the people. Uh, they uh, don't really want to think of an, another war, and so they push it away and mm -hmm. just live their life. And uh, they as are you, afraid of the thought, you know, of war. As you look back uh, since the end of the war in 45, how would you say this threat of a new war has developed? What's made it develop? What are the factors? Oh, we could count a lot of political events, I think, that are on this. But mm -hmm. uh, I think the most thing, the thing that has developed is most strongly was uh, the uh, Cold War, the Cold War between the West and the East. And uh, all the, uh, and sometimes when the Cold War broke out and became a hot war, like in Korea, this tension grew and uh, uh, it, is, it was growing when we heard about the weapons in the Middle East and things like that. And, uh, it is growing when uh, I personally go, come to West Berlin or thing like, uh, things like that and see what is done and what is happening. But, uh, Christoph, you said a moment ago that in Germany people don't think about war very much because they don't want it to happen, and yet you're right there with the Russians across the frontier. I should think it would be nearer to you. Perhaps that's why they don't want to think yes. of it, because yeah. it's so near to them. Whereas, oh. go on, come on. <laughs> we really fear the thought of... Uh, uh, of war, you know, and that's why if we, if I, I think, if I uh, settle down and begin to think about this really deep, and uh, I would come to the conclusion that it's almost silly uh, to build up things as, uh, or to go to school anymore to learn things as uh, the danger is so near to you. Uh, but uh, we push it off, and that's why the way how we can live, I suppose. It's a strange thing that you, um, in Germany, being so close to the communists, they should try and push the thought of war away from them. Um, it's rather different in England. They, they try and push the thought of war away, of course. But I think that the tension, if there is any tension, is aroused mainly through ignorance. We don't know the communists because, well, to us, you're in East, in Germany, you do see communists come over, well, don't you? Yeah. But we don't. All we know about the communists is we read about them in the papers. And, well, some of the papers, purposely try and perhaps give us a false impression of them. Definitely. And to the average British person, it, it doesn't seem humanly possible that the Russians are ordinary people like it's us. Exactly yes. We get a wrong impression of us, and I'm sure that's partly why the tension is there. Either Maybe the politicians you're being, want Excuse them. me, Judith, Sorry. you're being awfully quiet. Oh, Does well. this <laughs> current Cold War between East and West, is it of interest in Ethiopia? Does it affect your thinking at all? Yes, as Ethiopia is now busy uh, progressing in the field of Western civilization, she couldn't afford uh, spending much time and money and energy on armaments and uh, pursuing the political doctrines of the West and East. As for politics, she is uh, more likely on the democratic part. Uh, people seem not to understand uh, communism quite well in Ethiopia. Do you have any communist party there? No. None to speak of. Well, you see, it's, it's quite... Um, what you stated of Great Britain, it's, it might be a little similar to Germany, as people are, through economical, uh, what they gain economically, uh, they're a little... Most, quite a lot of them are quite uh, satisfied. And, you know, they, they don't take the trouble of thinking of the other side. Quite a lot of them do it. And that is the trouble we have. You know, if we don't keep thinking and helping the other side, the people in the eastern zone, there might be danger of uh, the, and there will be the danger of uh, that this piece of land will be cut off and the people who live there and are in connection with us, should be in connection with us, are cut off too. You know, that's why I think that um, there is no alternative to war, that we don't really know the other side's point of view. And I don't think it's till then, to every land has, every person in every land has been raised to a much higher level of civilization. But we will be able to have peace by peaceful methods. Uh, let me go back just a moment to the war you know, the war in 1939. Uh, was there any alternative to war, do you think, in 1939? Oh, gosh, uh, <laughs> if I were a politician, maybe I could answer that. But it seems to me from what I've read and what I've heard that well, for Britain, there wasn't. We'd waited too long already. Um, in the first place, if we tried to stop it before, in 1936 or somewhere earlier like that, um, maybe we could have done, but by 1938 and 9, it was too late. We'd let no, Hitler get to... Oh, would you? Well, 
<laughs> you will. But... I really think that um, Britain need not have gone to war. Oh, I know it's... that it would have been hard, but it would have been morally much better <clears throat> for her to have let the Germans occupy England. I know everyone will disagree well, with no, me uh... when I say this, but didn't Jesus said, if you're hit on one side, you should turn the other cheek. Yes, I know it's an ideal, but you've got to... You've got yes, to I agree with you, in effect. I, I'm not sure in my own mind. I haven't decided whether I agree with pacifism or not. But I'm speaking from the, the point of view of the, the politicians then in England. I mean, Mr. Chamberlain, he, he thought he'd made a peace treaty in the Treaty of Munich. He thought he'd satisfied Hitler and he'd stopped a war. And he came back to England jubilant. And all the people in England were amazed and thrilled. And then within a year, the whole war had broken out. Well, I, I think what you state about the moral thing of the of the whole affair. Mm -hmm. You said it would have been morally right if Britain would have not stood the Germans. I think that is wrong. No, but you can't. Oh, well, <laughs> you can't. Let him finish, let him finish, Elizabeth. Oh, well, you see, I think if, if ever there is, uh, you're attacked by another nation and you know, or at least you believe, that the right is on your side, that is the war of defense. A war of defense is necessary and is morally a right. No, you cannot defeat evil oh. by evil. <laughs> yes, how do we know you we're cannot. right? I mean, everybody yes, thinks they're right. Well, of course, they're of course, right. that's quite a difficult thing about no, it. Right. But uh, as long as you know that your rights of living are attacked by the other, na by another nation or by an aggressor, you, uh, your defense is necessary, and you should take it. Let, let's try to probe into this in another way. Are there any? Can you make any comparison between the situation in the 1930s? and the situation today in terms of the threat of war and war building up? Yes, I would say there is, there is a lot of comparison between the world situation in the mid-30s and today. In the mid-30s there, there were two political parties and these were the Nazis and the fascists and the Japan making one world and the rest of the world making another world. Today this seems to, be, to happen here. The Democrats on one side and the uh, Russians, the communists on one side. So naturally there is a tension amongst these uh, people as there, is, as there was in the future, in the past. Yeah, and th I think this tension is, is due to, the, to uh, the development that people are not um, ready to give in for a compromise anymore, but uh, like the status quo. They like a, uh, the Korean peace treaty. Oh, it's not a peace treaty yet, but they like the... Armistice. They, they, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they just um, don't like it, really, but they uh, think it is good for a time. They think the German uh, dividends is good for a time. And they think uh, um, the, uh, how they solve the Israel problem in the Middle East is good for a time. Yes, and they, have not the, they are not, have not the courage, and perhaps not the encouragement by the other nations, by development of political affairs, to tackle these problems, really. But these things take time, and you can't rush things like that. I mean, surely one stepping stone. If you try to do so things suddenly, you often get in a worse mess than you're in before. Uh, just a second, Christoph. I want to pick up a point that Navy made, because it almost brings us to an inevitable conclusion. Judy said she thought war was not inevitable. Navy disagreed with her completely. Of uh, then Navy said that there is a complete similarity. You said that there is an alternative to war, yes, didn't I you? Did. Yes, and Navy said he disagreed. No, he disagreed with you. Oh, he disagreed with you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, we'll take it with you and Judy. Uh, then Navy is now pointing out that there is almost a complete similarity between the situation in the 30s with the democratic powers against the fascist powers and the situation today with the dem democracies on one side and the Russians on the other. Well, uh, does that... Uh, Yes, but nowadays, uh, I suppose, I don't think any nation wants war. But I suppose you can say that about the 1930s as well. But Hitler did, didn't he? Well, is there anything different now? Yes, they don't want war. At least I don't think they and, do. And the fear on both sides is so strong that uh, really no one dares to begin a war. It is right. because, uh, because of, well, it's, I think bomb. it's the atom bomb. Oh, but that is, that atom bomb oh. is quite wrong. It, way back in the 12th century, um, <laughs> the Pope made a decree. He said that um, this new crossbow, which had just been invented, no one was allowed to use it because if it was used, the whole mankind would be swept, would well, be wiped out. Well, that's what we're saying about the atom bomb. We don't really know. There might be even worse. Well, look here. 
Oh, look happened? here. The science has stated that the atom bomb is such a, mm. uh, such a horrible and such well, a man-killing we weapon. said before, and he oh, was never wrong. Oh, well, science <laughs> found out. Now, you, you ca just can't uh, um, uh, uh, find a similarity to the 12th century, I think. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think that is what the balance of power nowadays is that what what's, uh, keeps the peace, or at least the... Um, that you think peace is that there are no weapons uh, ar arise and there's no men being killed and things like that. Real peace is something very different. But uh, the thing that we can achieve right now as a, um, some sort of balance, very balanced, outbalanced power and uh, that nations um, in fear for, of one another do not start a war. They know a war they'll start is, will be unsuccessful in any case. Yes, I, I agree with you. I think that at the moment it is fear which is stopping any war. Um, America, well, the West and the East possess equal power, if you like. But surely fear isn't a good thing to have behind. I mean, well, uh, it's a very unsure yeah. basis for peace. Yes. There is one thing that, this, that the present generation should be proud of. That is the United Nations. Yes, I agree. And this uh, organization, uh, rather than encouraging war, discourages war. And... Uh, uh, actually, there couldn't be, uh, war couldn't be an alternative, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, peace can only be established by means of uh, moral development. Yeah, but haven't we seen that, uh, the, um, the, that the United Nations have been, well, they have achieved quite a bit, okay, but, uh, <laughs> they, you, know, you know, they have not been very powerful, one, one veto, and the whole thing had to be stopped, the whole thing had to be redone, talked over again, and, uh, of course, democratic government and, uh, is a very, it takes a lot, very long time. Uh, especially, I think, a world government is a very hard thing to achieve. But uh, uh, the thing that could be an alternative, alternative to war <laughs> is not, uh, to my opinion, not the United Nations at the present moment now, but it, uh, it, is, it is the fear, and that is the, some sort of guarantee for peace. And it, uh, out of this fear, you said it's, it's a bad thing to have mm -hmm. behind, but. I think out of this fear will arise a more uh, more reasonless, reasonable way of uh, of uh, understanding the other and looking at the other. I'm sure about that. The stat the fear is only a thing that holds on for short, but not but not a it doesn't to be keep. Up yeah, it must it has to be stirred up really, and it is not stirred up uh, like it should uh, like it can be by a cold war. But do you consider Wait a minute, entirely, Judith disagreeing completely. Entirely. I think a lot of the most evil things in this world are caused by fear. Yes. Fear and ignorance. Yes. I mean, that's... A, oh, I can't quite explain <laughs> it, but I'm sure you, you, it would just be impossible to get peace through, through that basis. Well, there is one thing that seems to hinder the uh, real... Uh, the real expansion of peace throughout the world, or the maintenance of peace throughout the world, and that is this... Cold War that uh, seems to exist between Russia and the uh, United okay. States, and that's caused by fear and by suspicion. Well, that springs well, from yeah, fear. Yeah, of course. But it? I think the, that uh, uh, this fear can be overcome by uh, the readiness to understand. Uh, well, you see, I'm on this forum. I think uh, it has been a great help to all of us to know the other side of it and to uh, get to learn other points of view. And I think if we try to get them and to aspects of international politics and try to get them on the Russians, try to get them on the Americans, try, try to get, then uh, there, might be great, uh, there might be great help uh, towards an understanding and an overcoming of fear. Let me interrupt just one second. You implied a moment ago, both of you talking about the atomic age, that nobody would win a third world war. Did anybody win the last one? Yes, Australia. <laughs> oh. Yes, we did. We well, don't <laughs> boast of it. It's a horrible thing to boast of. Oh, but, but no, I'm not boasting that we killed a lot of people <laughs> or anything like that. I mean economically. Economically, we were in debt to Britain, and uh, we paid back. Thank you. <laughs> we paid back through the war a lot of our debts, not only the interest, but the capital. But we had, as Prime Minister, Mr. Chifley, who everyone... Uh, Nitz was a financial genius, well, of course, so of course, of course it was not yeah. only the war. <laughs> <laughs> well, but look here, is that a, a good pay for a war? Is that an equal pay for a war that has been, where 50 million people have been killed? I oh, think it's, no, no. in, in any case, it's not. And you. if we look at, the, look at it from this way, of, um, this aspect, is that right, aspect? <laughs> good. <laughs> uh, then uh, we'll find out that uh, nobody really has won the war up as to the 
um, things they put in it. The only thing that has been won, of course, is a that the threatening has been taken away from the world and that it hasn't. part that half Germany has got a, dem a democratical government and the other one has not. In other ways, you can't win a war unless you win it by peaceful means. But you, you can't As for Ethiopia, you know, <laughs> as for Ethiopia... Right. Just a minute, let Navy have a chance. As for Ethiopia during the last war, though she hasn't been much involved in the Second World War, has won a great deal uh, morally. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. The people before the World War, or before the Italian aggression, were divided um, socially, as far as religiously, and many things. But afterwards, they feel the real need of unity, and the Italians themselves taught the dignity of labor, and everybody was working hard to maintain a decent standard of life, yeah. which are the basis of Western civilization. Well, but look here, I think that is very typical for the development of war, that the nations that are put in the most of the force and most of their... their hey, look, here's Johan. Are you so anxious <laughs> to get into nice this? Sentence. Let him finish. Okay, I'm sorry, Christoph. Finish. Johan, wait. <laughs> that the, the nations who put in all their force and all their money, that they don't really achieve a thing from it, but they, um, they lose it, actually. Yes, war is an economic loss to both winner and loser. Mm. And oh. not, um, above that, not on, only economic loss. Now, if we do find an alternative to war this time, what do you think the force is going to be? I interrupted you a moment ago when you were saying it was going to be fear. Is there any other thing that's going to motivate us, or is that the so... It, there must not be fear. Uh, fear must not be... You, you said another thing. I don't think you should have fear. I should think there should be just one other thing. Fear. Well, but how can you get away from it? Well, you see... Um, I think Albert Schweitzer has summed it up very neatly in several words. If every nation would recognize reverence for life, and every person in that nation, then if every person did, surely the politicians at the top would. Yes, but it's a little difficult now. Let's, uh, let's not look at the politicians as being bad <laughs> persons, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, the only thing, the only solution I see to that problem is probably that there's a development of understanding. And that is, if we have that, we have the main condition for peace. What were you going to say, Navy? If the tension between the United States and the Russians is uh, reduced or lessened, there, this only is the alternative to war. Uh, Johan, you want to get in there so yeah, much. I think you're all forgetting one very important... Let me introduce you first. Johan from Norway. Johan Holst from Norway. Yeah, yeah, I think you're all forgetting one very important factor about the United Nations organization. You see, today they are trying to prevent war in a positive rather than a negative way. That is, uh, they are trying to establish a decent life for every human being, such as stated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you know. And the work being actually done, the very important work by the different safe agencies of the United Nations in the economical, social, educational yeah, yeah. and medical field, yeah. that is, cre they create a foundation upon which it will be possible to build a dynamic peace. This is the great difference between the uh, United Nations and the former legal nations, which only aim at re-establishing pre-war conditions. And I think you cannot um, uh, discuss whether war or peace without taking this into consideration. Well, uh, yes. that's, that I takes agree. such a long time, you know, <laughs> until you were there. We need peace now. Yeah, maybe you yeah. said that there was an almost complete similarity between the situation in the 30s and the situation today. Would you agree with Johan that there is this brand new factor yes, that's agree. coming into the situation today? I agree. Uh, I never thought of that until Johan pointed it out. <laughs> because <laughs> Ethiopia would be a country who would benefit greatly mm. oh, yes. uh, from oh, yeah. economic uh -huh. development. Uh, do you think this is worth a discussion? Yes. Yeah. Well, should we do this next week? Yeah, for underdeveloped yes. countries. Yes. Johan, will you come back on the program next week and talk uh, about this? I do this? hope I will come back. I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you what I really mean. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You, you, well, we haven't any more time now. I'm terribly sorry. Our yeah. half hour is up. But next week, we will go on with your challenge and discuss this new factor, removing the economic causes of war. I think that will be very interesting. Mm -hmm. This has been The World We Want, a program featuring students from 30